It's time for the Rhino Charge again. The unique off-road four-wheel drive event that pits man and machine against bush and fundraising, all to build the world's longest conservation fence. The fence surrounds Kenya's Aberdare mountain ecosystem, the key water catchment for millions of Kenyans, and home to some of the country's most diverse and unique species of plants and wildlife. For the last 18 years, the fence has slowly and surely wound its way around the Aberdares, and the Rhino Charge event has helped raise the money to fund it. This year's Rhino Charge is being held in Swari in Samburu district, northern Kenya. The area is very remote and rarely travelled, and the charges are in for a whole new set of challenges. But getting here is the first task. After an eight-hour drive from Nairobi, the first stop is check-in and then information. Hi, how are you? Thank you. Maldives. The next challenge is finding your campsite, getting organized and settling in before dark. In the morning, all 58 competing cars must congregate for strict pre-race checks and procedures. As the competitors wait for scrutineering, some charge veterans are sure of their goals. This year's going to come first in everything. I've been doing this for say, eight, nine years now. We need to win sometimes. A few have a winning technique to follow. I just check my route with my, my little crystal and I just ask it which way to go. I always drive, they run around and we shout at each other. We go left, right and we get through. I don't know. Some teams are more prepared than others. Uh, we're practicing already a broken ankle, so I mean fully prepared. We just run out of time. It's very difficult to organise work with pleasure, with home life and getting the car finished. But this year we finished a little bit on early. Uh, training a little more than last year, a little less than we should do. So. Under the car most of the time. <laughs> yeah. We spend about three months on the car. We tend to strip it down and rebuild again. We've been fortunate in that we've never gone out with a mechanical problem. And I think that's because of preparation. And we've just, over the years, we've done it so many times that we've pretty much a unit. And the newcomers mentally prepare themselves. I am so far fantastic. A little bit nervous. Um, I'm not going to get that cocky and say I'm going to win. Um, it's my first time driving in this. So I'm going to do my best and I want to finish. During scrutineering, each car must face and pass inspection. Thank you. How many spares? Two. Two. Only. Only two, yes. Don't say that. Road license? Road license is that. September 05. No, 06. Oh, we're just winding me out. Each vehicle is then fitted with a GPS, which flashes green and red as it operates. This new high tech tracking device is practically foolproof. And this is how the organisers will track where we've been, and um, immediately after the races, and we're in a winning position. The person who's done the least amount of distance between points, least variation off the, off the route of a direct line, will win. Is he talking bollocks? He's talking sense. I'm oh, talking okay. sense. That makes sense. Right, we're off. Once scrutineering is finished, all competitors head to the pre-race briefing. Everyone is anxious to see the coordinates, including special visitors two guards from the Tower of London who have come to participate in tomorrow's charge. Finally, the control coordinates are revealed and maps are distributed. It's now time for teams to strategize. To win the Rhino Charge, you must cover the shortest distance between 13 checkpoints in the least amount of time. Like solving a puzzle, the competitors must find the coordinates and calculate the best possible route. It's going to be a long night for many as they plan their course through this vast and arid corner of Kenya. Up before dawn, the chargers meet in the dark, having drawn lots for their starting positions. The 58 competing cars are divided between 
between the course's 13 checkpoints. Pre-race nerves get soothed and there is a lot of speculation. Um, having looked at this map, we are quite concerned this is going to be the most difficult one we've ever done. It's really hard terrain. The vehicles are then officially led in convoy to their starting checkpoints. At 7.30 exactly, the event begins and all teams leave to follow their ideal course. They have 10 hours to make it to all the other checkpoints and to get back to their starting position. The course is spread out over 55 kilometers of bush filled with deep luggers, mountains and riverbeds which for some seems like the path of least resistance. But for others, a definite sand trap. This year's gauntlet includes the river and there's no easy way to get in or out. Hot! A lot of laggers, a lot of fun. So which way are you going? Perfect car. Uh, down there, this okay. bus car looks very close. It's not. The Rhino Charge is designed to include two Tiger Lines and one Gauntlet. The Gauntlet is created to be an extreme test of bushcraft ability and driving dexterity. This year's Gauntlet has several steep, rocky slopes and a highway of river rocks to navigate. Rhino Charge may seem like all fun and games, but the cause it supports is incredibly important. Well, after this last drought, had we not started this 17 years ago, uh, at the end of that drought, Nairobi would have been without water for sure. Okay. The Aberdare Mountain ecosystem is the key water catchment for Nairobi City and millions of Kenyans. To safeguard the Aberdares is absolutely necessary. And the best way to do it is with an electrified, game-proof fence. The fence line has almost completed its circuit around the Aberdares, with only two phases of construction left to go. Recently, the longest and most difficult section of fence construction was completed. Nobel Peace Prize laureate and champion conservationist Professor Wangare Maadai helped plant the final post of phase five, marking an important day for everyone. This commemorative plaque here, at the same time congratulate the people who have been involved in it and thank them on behalf of all of us and on behalf of many generations yet to come for the efforts they are making to conserve this ecosystem. The celebration was attended and by community before, members and officials. And I would like to encourage communities around this area to engage more in ecotourism. When we protect this park, we are actually going to encourage visitors to come. And as visitors come, we want them to be dropping their dollars and euros. Most Kenyans don't quite appreciate the role of tourism and the, the amount of money the government makes out of tourism. And if we were to manage our uh, wildlife well and manage and protect our ecosystems, I'm quite sure that that's a heritage that many generations in the future could still benefit from. The community expressed their gratitude for the fence with traditional dances and songs. Now that the fence is in place, Human wildlife conflict in the area has ceased and crops are flourishing. Back at the charge, teams are trying to find their way to the Braeburn checkpoint. And the only ones who seem to know where they are are the local Samburu. 
over to left bridge, sir. Do we get round like that? Negative. Team 39 have been roving the countryside for several hours trying to get to the Braeburn checkpoint. They are trapped between two very steep hills. If we go around the corner here, down to the lugger, and we only have to go around the thing, we've got to get up this side here to go up this whole spur here. Okay? So we need to get over onto it. We need to get over. We need to get into the lugger. We need to get into the lugger to get out of the lugger. And we can, from the top up there, we can get out of the lugger. Once down in the lugger, things should be a bit easier. Hey, look, 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 it's not just from that. It's got to be that. It's got to be that. All right. Go, 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 But it turns out that they're just as stuck as they were before. And the lugger doesn't provide a simple solution. And the only thing to do is to climb back up what they've just come down. This is absolutely exhausting. And to make matters worse... <laughs> what happened? He's out. What happened? That means follow me, in Muppet. Not you inhale the fly. Yeah, I think it was, actually. Oh. <laughs> is it good? Uh, there we go. That's your lunch, mate. Some cars have found their way out of the bush and onto a road. But by now, are worse for wear. Uh, we, our oil reservoir is leaking, and so we're putting a bit of uh, super glue on it. Edward, can I suggest that we continue with the road? Car 30 is up and running again, while just down the road, Car 51 is not so lucky. It's given up the ghost and uh, we're hanging out the white flag and, uh, you know, calling it a day. Well, blew an engine on engine the way knock. here. After the gauntlet, the engine didn't have the heart to do much more. Took it through straight routes. <laughs> we couldn't take anything else. The gauntlet took the car's soul away. <laughs> While Team 51 waits to be rescued, Car 8 gets a helping hand at the Hardy checkpoint. We were supposed to be helping them. We came like to have ended up helping us. Yeah, that's the sort of thing we want to see. Other competitors helping other competitors. It's traditional for charges to stop and help each other, but the day is getting late and car 7 still has many checkpoints to go. As car 7 leaves, team 16 comes sailing in. It's uh, running sweet as a five-legged elephant. The car is running well, but they're still not getting around the cores fast enough. Okay. It's probably the toughest one that I've been involved in. <laughs> Very few cars in the t have, have boarded this control um, <clears throat> in the, the number of hours that have passed since the start. We've had six, 16 cars and it's quarter, to, it's quarter to two in the afternoon. This year's Rhino Charge is turning out to be a serious challenge. But the biggest challenge for the competitors is raising the money for the fence. Fundraising, well there is over 50 participants fundraising so it's hard. The fundraising is really hard work especially in this environment in Kenya. To be really honest I enjoy the fundraising bit because we always set ourselves pretty high targets and, and, and amaze ourselves that we've been able to raise as much as we, we set as a target. In order to compete in the Rhino Charge each team is required to raise a minimum amount. However many teams raise considerably more. Last year's event raised over 53 million Kenya shillings, or just over 700,000 US dollars, all funds to be used for the fence line. Originally, the fence was going to be between 320 and 350 kilometers long, but now it's been decided to incorporate Mount Kipipiri and, of course, to create an elephant corridor between Mount Kipipiri and the Abadares. This will take the final distance of the fence to about 400 kilometers. This 
is where the elephants will travel between the main Aberdeer massif, the mountains that ra rise to 4,000 meters, across this great sweeping valley here, which is all forest department land, and they will be able to migrate through the corridor, which is four kilometers wide, onto Mount Kipipiri, where there is a resident herd of approximately 30 to 50 at all times. But those herds, at the moment, they encroach into the farmland, which is all around this area, and create enormous problems and occasionally kill people. Now, once we have the fence in, this situation will be totally resolved. The so elephant go, do a great deal so of damage are, in the area. We were in that chamber, and the, the neighbors made noise, and they came and broke our, our fence here, and then went back to the forest. Actually, we are hoping that the fence may, comes as quickly as possible at our side, as we are hearing from the other side, people are not having conflict, conflict with the animals. So we are hoping the fence comes and this problem will completely go. And as you can hear, we are having sounds of tractors and uh, power saws. There are people cutting down trees and uh, if the fence comes, you may never know whether they will go in the night and cut the trees. So when the fence comes, all this will just stop. So we are hoping that just the fence comes. Communities that live along the fence line have benefited enormously, but they also have new challenges. Here, in the Kakika community, they have started several tree nurseries. We are raising trees, both indigenous and uh, exotic. Indigenous could be replanted to the already degraded forest. The exotic will be planted in our farms or the community farms for commercial purposes and also to, to discourage community from destroying the already deforested areas. That's why we decided to raise the trees here so that later on we can replant them. The forest inside the fence is slowly regenerating, but there is still a huge problem with human access. 